If you have <clears throat> noted our curriculum as set forth in our outline of academic program, you will note that one of the subjects which we have considered important is the philosophy of history. And so this evening we will present the first of a series of discussions bearing upon this subject. And as it seems that history is a rather sterile subject, as generally considered, we would like to do something, if possible, to point up its importance from the standpoint of its effect upon our daily living and daily thinking. First of all, what is history? The word is broadly used in two meanings. History is basically events, actual occurrences, factual happenings. The second meaning of the word is the record of such events. Now, there's a great difference between these two meanings, although this may not at first seem especially relevant. The fact of happenings we cannot deny, but the records of these happenings are not always as authentic or complete as we might desire. What are the principal handicaps that face the modern student of history? Let us go back uh, to perhaps the most challenging part of the historical perspective, and that is origins. All origins relating to our cultures and our societies are obscured by a mystery which we call the dark curtain of history. We can go back a certain distance, and beyond that point we fall into uncertainties. Perhaps the greatest basic reason for these uncertainties is the inadequacy of ancient recording. Up to a period which we will describe later, man had no systematic way of preserving the records of his experiences. And this immediately gives us another interesting sidelight. Ancient history did not depend primarily upon the importance of events, but upon the nature of the materials upon which the records were kept. Thus a vital and important incident recorded on a perishable medium may disappear and did. Whereas a less important event upon a more enduring medium preserved upon stone or cut into marble or cast into bronze may have continued for our admiration. So the first hazard of history was writing materials. The second hazard was that histories must be written to a measure at least by contemporaries, in order that later historians may draw upon source material, this material must have existed. And in each generation and each century, man determined in the light of contemporary emphasis that which was important and that which required or justified perpetuation. Thus, as we go backward in our historical research, we observe only certain episodes or incidents clearly preserved for us. For such reasons as this, ancient records relate primarily to religion and history. History in the sense of dynasties, rulers, princes, and powerful persons who profoundly influenced the psychological attitudes of their contemporaries. Likewise also, it was the king and the priest who had available the materials, the means, 
for the perpetuation of accounts. It follows from this that the royal records and the ecclesiastical records are the oldest and the best preserved. Even in these, however, there are differences and difficulties. The fall of dynasties, particularly in Egypt, resulted in the obliteration of previous records. And the decline of faiths often caused old records to be destroyed by new cults wishing to remove all record of their predecessor. Thus we have vandalism as well as the natural circumstances of time gravitating against the preservation of history. We also realize that when histories are written by a limited group of persons, particularly privileged or prejudiced persons, we cannot depend entirely upon their validity. In the Greek period, one scholar stood very firmly and said, the non-factual historian is a traitor to the ages. And this is true, essentially. Because if we receive biased accounts of previous occurrences, the important philosophical contribution of history is damaged. History today is approached more or less psychologically. We are not so much interested in the events which at one time dominated public attention. We are interested in the relationships between events. We are interested in penetrating the sequences of causes and effects. We want to understand why it came about that certain insignificant minority groups rose to power and world position. We also want to know the machinery which toppled great empires into oblivion. We want to understand the operation of cause and effect as this is recorded in historical annals. Thus we come to what has been termed the morality of history. The evidence that history is a broad justification of the great ethical and moral institutions which men have cherished from time immemorial. We like to believe that from the contemplation of history we may gain useful instruction for the conduct of our own affairs. This brings us to the next, perhaps most valid consideration. Where does history begin in relation to the focal point of ourselves? Man is surrounded constantly with occurrences. Those immediately occurring, those things which happen from day to day, we record or like to think of as news. News is what is happening. History is what has happened. The moment an incident ceases to become or ceases to be news, it becomes history. History must therefore not be limited to national, racial, cultural motions. History can be applied to any subject in which a dynamic of sequences can be recognized. As one historian has said, everything that lives is historical. And there are many things which do not have a life in themselves about which history can also be gathered. We can write the history of a Ford car and the development of the automotive industry. We can write the history of motion pictures. If present conditions continue, we may also write its obituary, apparently. We can write the history of a cell in the human body. Therefore, history reaches into biology into physics, into chemistry, into mathematics, into atomics. For everything which has a continuance has a history. These records 
we know today must be accurate in order for them to be useful in the advancement of man's knowledge. During the 16th and 17th centuries, histories of strange things are included. Lord Bacon, for example, wrote a work entitled The Natural History of Winds, in which he collected various material bearing upon air currents, storms, and other astrophysical phenomena on the assumption that the gathering of all forms of statistical information constituted a form of history. The hot summer of 52, the cold winter of 49, the depression of 29, all these facts are valuable if we know what to do with them. As we go along, we are inclined, therefore, to accept historical record without too much question. And in this way, we have made numerous and profound mistakes. Up to comparatively recent times, there have been few impartial historians. For many hundreds of years, histories were written by victors at the expense of the vanquished. The loser was always badly treated in history, regardless of the causes or values involved. Also, history has been mutilated with innumerable prejudices and false accounts, and it has also been unable uh, to penetrate in all cases the veil of deceit which surrounded an incident or a happening. Thus persons have been wrongly accused, false credits have been given, proper applause has been withheld, blame and censure have been misplaced. These things in themselves are unfortunate, but perhaps we can say not too significant when all persons involved are long deceased. The real significance lies in this philosophical descent of history, in which every error becomes a weak point in a chain of logic or in a chain of research and may cause us to come to faulty conclusions about processes or attitudes which we should hold today. It is useless to say that the individual can escape history. History is a psychological force in the life of every person even among so-called illiterate savage groups, oral tradition, which is their form of history, has a vital effect upon the survival of customs, beliefs, fears, hates, affections, regards, friendships, jealousies, and feuds. Perhaps the most desperately detrimental factor in European civilization has been its perpetuation of international, interracial, interreligious feuds, which have become the dead causes of continuing living disaster. Thus history becomes vital to us. And until the 20th century, or certainly the 19th, very little effort was made to record the history of peoples. The so-called private citizen was forgotten by history. Into the limbo of blessed forgetfulness have flowed the careers of countless hundreds of millions of living persons. Yet these careers have not been totally and completely sterile. Some of the greatest achievements which we have today would have been impossible had it not been for the activities of persons not recorded at our time. Thus we have to fall back upon the collectives. We have to realize that almost all major changes in the destinies of collective groups have been the result of the activities of individuals. It has been estimated 
that in a generation such as ours today, the weight of the world's security and its advancement rests in the keeping of not more than 10,000 living persons. All the rest are dependent upon this small group in some way. It may be that it was only a sentence that someone uttered that would cause millions of others to move. But that one person, remembered or forgotten, who sparked the change or incited the motion is still the guiding and dominant spirit. Thus history is actually also the record of man's acceptances and rejections of various policies, attitudes, pronouncements, convictions stated long ago by individuals in turn perpetuated first by small groups. We know, for example, that it would be impossible today to estimate the effect of the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. One man preaching on the Sea of Galilee has changed the course of billions of human lives. We may say the same in Asia that it is almost impossible to estimate the effects of the teachings of Gautama Buddha. These effects continue. It is not likely that during his lifetime Plato ever had more than 200 or 250 followers, probably less. It is doubtful if the dialogues of Plato existed in more than 20 copies at the time of his death. And yet there is no political structure or social institution known to the civilized world today that has not been affected. These things have unfolded and continued, increasing in a strange and mysterious manner. What does this tell us from an historical perspective? It tells us that ideas are all subject to the censorship of history. By this we mean that they must pass through time. And in their descent through time, they are applied by a variety of individuals to a variety of purposes. If these applications fail, or the ends are inconsistent with the needs, the material or idea is rapidly lost. It disintegrates. It disappears. Now you might say that none of these older records actually disappear. They do in the course of time, but perhaps time again must be more carefully analyzed. The British Museum at the present time contains probably 14 million volumes. It is the greatest accumulation of books in the world. Of these almost innumerable, inconceivable volumes. There are thousands, probably hundreds of thousands, which will not be touched, opened, or read in the next thousand years. The persons who wrote them exercised prodigious influences at certain times. But these influences have not survived the changes of history and have lost all vitality for us today. I can think of one early group of sermons by a prominent divine who was greatly honored in his own day and was an outstanding exponent of hellfire and damnation. In this generation he is not only seldom read, but his name is not even generally known, and there seems to be no reason to stir up a situation by mentioning it at this time. <laughs> it is far happier that he be allowed to rest in the desuetude of limbo. Thus, persons great, prominent, or important in their own day 
disappear from our remembrance. And others, almost forgotten, are suddenly revived or brought back to our attention because we have suddenly learned to appreciate or recognize some value or have come into some situation which they anticipated or have sensed in them a prophetic mood about the shape of things which now concern us. Thus history is a sieve constantly sifting out and separating the living and the dead. Living not in the sense of bodily existence, but living in the sense of idea. Dying not of body, but dying of idea which is no longer valid or no longer important to us. Thus history tells us an important lesson. It tells us, for example, that there is nothing changeless but change. It tells us that life as we know it is a continuous, dynamic unfolding of potential. That everything that exists grows. And everything that has being obeys the discovery of Galileo. It moves. It has within it motion. And history is a record of qualitative motion as well as the descent of families or of states or of nations. As we go back over history, therefore, we are reminded not only of the episodes which it preserves, but of the silences which it also keeps. We are aware of the tyrannies of the past, we observe man's inhumanity to man. We observe also in broad moral and ethical terms that history is a long record of the victory of good over evil, the victory of progress over decadence, the victory of life over death, the victory of motion over static the victory of dynamic over impotence in all fields and departments of existence. History is also the optimistic reminder that in the midst of days when everything seems to be going wrong, that history is the record of a slow but inevitable growth. And history is also a reminder that growth cannot be without interludes of decline, but also that life and death, growth and decay, progress and deterioration, these forces operate simultaneously. And the descent of every culture has had contemporary ascent of other cultures. The falling of a nation corresponds in time to the birth of a nation. And while each individual in history has departed, the great vital motions of human experience and activity go on unbroken. So history is the story of the victorious survival, the eternal resurrection of life from death, of the new from the old, of light from darkness, a reminder that every night must end in dawn, just as surely as every day must end in night. And as history is the valid account of an eternal restoration, a continuing resurrection as insistent and inevitable as the seasons which follow themselves in nature. So we can understand why ancient peoples in their allegories and symbols associated the story of history with the great cycle of the phoenix. Now this brings to us perhaps a key 
uh, to one of the most interesting and remarkable fables of the past. A fable which factually and actually we cannot fully explain today simply because of the imperfections of history. But enough has descended to us to be able to restore in part at least the broad pattern of this symbolical concept. Ancient peoples including the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Persians, the Hindus and the Chinese and a little later the Japanese all shared the belief in the existence of a strange and fabulous bird called the Phoenix. In the ancient belief particularly in the Mesopotamian and North African areas. Only one of these birds lived at a time. The Chinese said that there were a pair. But the cycle of the phoenix was the life of this bird. And this bird, when it died, first built a nest of flames in which its body was consumed. And as it died, its body burst open, and the newborn phoenix came forth. Therefore it was born of fire and of death, and as such was represented in ancient symbolism, usually as a bird similar to an eagle, surrounded by flames, with wings spread, as though soaring upward to the sun. The phoenix to the Egyptians and most other ancient peoples was a symbol of immortality, but it was also the symbol of a time cycle. Rhodius and many others have left us records of the phoenix. Cicero mentions it, so does Seneca. And in the story of China, we have it preserved for us in a strange bird resembling a crested pheasant. It comes to us also as the Quetzal bird of Central America, of the Aztec and Mayan cultures. And it is the Thunderbird of the North American Indians and the Totem Indians of the Northwest. This bird was a symbol of priesthood because in ancient times, the logographi, or the keepers of the words, historians, were priests. When the time came to devise a symbol for the great seal of the United States, the original design was a phoenix, because it was definitely an emblem of restoration, of regeneration, of resurrection, of the attainment of freedom, and of the victory of life over death, of light over darkness, and of wisdom over ignorance. Many cycles were attributed to the phoenix. Some of them have a fair relation uh, to the great sequences of the equinoctial motions, others to the great metonic cycle of the moon. But perhaps the most interesting and mysterious cycle of the phoenix is not directly associated with any of our known astronomical cycles. For in Egypt, it was frequently said that the life of the phoenix was 600 years, and at the end of every 600 years, it flew into the desert, built its flaming altar, and there died, and that it was then reborn, and that therefore every 600 years, there was a vital rebirth of history, a vital resurrection within the life of man, a restoration of the great social institutions uh, which constitute the foundations of human experience. This is an intriguing thought. And while obviously a great deal of necessary information to fill in this story cannot be found, can no longer be differentiated because even in some of our best histories uh, events are not placed within a thousand years. 
particularly after about 3500 B.C., or rather before 3500 B.C., still we can do considerably in attempting to clarify the possibility of the Phoenix Cycle. Before we go into this, however, there is a philosophy involved which I think we should also consider. History tells us that every motion, every institutionalized procedure of human experience contains within itself two factors, two intimately associated elements. One is the vitality by means of which it shall live and the other is the defect by which it must inevitably die. Therefore, everything that lives has the cause of its own death within itself. Every institution endures because of its strength and perishes because of its weakness. Thus, strength and weakness must exist together. And wherever institution exists, the corruption of that institution is almost inevitable. In fact, we have never been able to produce a system within which the essence or substance of its own ultimate deterioration does not exist any more than we can possess or develop a human body in which the cause of its own ultimate decease is not present. Uh, one famous physicist and biologist observed some years ago that man begins to die the day he is born. Races begin to die the day they are born. Everything that comes into this world by that very circumstance is subject to dissolution. Therefore, the only possible cause for death is birth. And that which is born can never escape. The processes of crystallization by means of which its organism will ultimately be rendered uninhabitable. Historically speaking, therefore, nations, empires, cultures, teaching, doctrines, all have cycles of existence. And the ancients divided these into various sequences using a basic unit of 600 years when applied to a social problem or to a political entity as we may use the ancient biblical unit of three score years and ten in measuring human life. We are changing that cycle somewhat but still we have a life expectancy which has become the basis of most calculations around which we build the theory of our personal survival and economy. Therefore, in multiples of 600 years, certain elements or factors have been distinguished. And even though nations may survive, peoples may continue Races may be strong enough to outlive a 600-year boundary. Within these groups, there are periodic changes by means of which the original directions or circumstances are altered. Therefore, it is rare indeed to find a philosophy that is not amended, a religion which has not been reformed, a nation, the government of which has not changed, or a cultural perspective which has not been modified in some way after a period of approximately 600 years. Or let us say at least that great and critical conditions have arisen in both the collective experience of total mankind and the more individual experience of racial and cultural groups by means of which 600 year markers can be rather clearly indicated. In almost every instance that we can conceive, 
A reformation is actually a kind of resurrection. The purpose of a reformation is to bring something from darkness into light. In this way, correcting a serious error, restating the direction of a purpose, rescuing ideas from the crystallization of institutional organization, breaking away from decadence to preserve progress, or in more recent times, the rededication of institution to the service of individual. These being, or this being, the outstanding motive behind social existence as it is today. Now we've mentioned that it's pretty difficult to go back into the early periods of human life and find historic records which give us clear perspective. Such records as we will find, as already noted, will most likely be of a political or a religious nature in the early periods. The only other type of record that we may find will be an important mass motion of peoples, like a migration. Such records will also often be punctuated by a distinct change in religious perspective. The rise of a moral code or the redirecting of a spiritual destiny for that people. A revelation, the advent of a Messiah, the emergence of a great modifying change. As we go further back, we must sometimes go through centuries in which we have no record except legendary. And we must accept that mythology can be, and often is, prehistoric history that due to inadequate records, the relationships of events have been lost. But sometimes, even in the corruption of history, psychological relationships have been preserved by mythological incidents, <coughs> as in the fables of gods and heroes, and in the fabulous accounts of the foundations of peoples. For in most instances, even today, in the search for the origins of ancient cultured groups, we have nothing but mythological material with which to work. Myth must therefore be regarded as psychologized history. It must be regarded as man's attempt to validate the laws of cause and effect involved in the emergence of his own destiny from a prehistoric veil or from an unknown historical background. Taking, however, a chronological sequence, I noted down and jotted a few things which perhaps will have a bearing upon our 600-year cycle. Now, these are not taken from a work in which this cycle was of the slightest significance. It's just one of those plain, old-fashioned, prosaic histories in which, however, the author attempted a valid and careful arraignment of his dates and facts. Part of this material is taken from Major General Furlong's Rivers of Life, and it will show you certain points which I wish to make. In this particular work, he places the date, 3600 B.C., as that of the rise of the great Egyptian ritual, which we call today the Book of the Dead. He says that at that time, forces and persons unknown, because we know no name at that period of any individual, with the possible exception of a few ferials, 
who were not the motivating factors. That at this time there arose among the Egyptians the great conviction of the immortality of man and the belief in a relationship, a moral relationship between conduct and spiritual destiny. In other words, at that time, the Egyptian took upon himself the full impact of the great funeral text or mortuary inscription beliefs that a good life, well lived, ensured the future state of the soul. This, therefore, would be a very great mark because we know that such a belief did not exist at that time in the Grecian states and we have no evidence even of its existence in Asia. No historical evidence. We have mythological report, which may be true. But General Furlong points out this date as a fairly certain one upon which to base one of the most important spiritual convictions which were later uh, one of the convictions which were later to profoundly influence the entire record of human life. Dropping in this case down toward the Christian era from 3600 Six years, 600 years to about 3000 BC. And let us see what was happening at about that time that might have some bearing on it. According to the Hindus, this date corresponds approximately with the beginning of the Kali Yuga. Now, the Kali Yuga, or the Black Age, was to the Hindu the beginning of the great karmic age of retribution which was to continue for 432,000 years and we are now enjoying ourselves in about the 5,000th year of the Kali Yuga and the Hindu describing in his ancient sacred books the conditions of the Kali Yuga says that during this great period men shall remember and observe certain things. First, that every man who has an elephant shall be called a Raja. Substitute Cadillac for elephant, and I think you get the idea. In other words, every man who is rich is a prince. The second thing that will mark the era is that man shall depart from the law and during the Kali Yuga shall develop great systems of philosophy or science which deny the existence of God. That was written 2000 B.C. The third point in connection with the Kali Yuga which was of great interest to the people of that time in attempting to predict the shape of things to come was that during this great day of darkness, or this great era, the family and the home would collapse, and individuals would place their own satisfaction above common good on every level. We're doing all right with the Kali Yuga, but we are not too happy over it. Now it is interesting that this date should correspond in the Egyptian chronicle with the date of the death of Osiris. Now obviously the death of Osiris is a mythological date. Therefore we are quite possibly in the presence of an overlapping testimony of cycles. The death of Osiris is described in the Egyptian rituals as the end of the Golden Age or the end of the Age of the Gods differentiating between the divine kings and the human kings ruling the world. This state would co correspond very closely with the concept, therefore, of the Kali Yuga. Kali meaning black, of course, and Yuga meaning age. 
This date further corresponds with the Greek mythological record of the Battle of the Titans, in which the gods were driven from the earth by giants, and the kingdom of heaven was overthrown, or at least was forced to retire from the active uh, participation in the estate of man. This date then also corresponds with the ancient date of the founding of the oracles, which were to take the places of the direct contact between the divinities and humanity. And the beginning of the oracles would also correspond in the ancient Hindu doctrine with the beginning of the great age of the rishis, or the heaven-sent teachers, who were to link man and the gods. So in all these different cultures, the year 3000 BC is either historically or mythologically related to an incident which may be regarded as the end of a divine era or an age of ancient things. Now continuing on our descent, we come to the year 2400 BC. And for reasons which he does not give, the great German Orientalist, Professor Max Müller, says that the year 2400 is the year which dates the keynote of universal religion. This is interesting, that these dates should fall in these patterns. Müller believed that at that time he was able to trace the rise of a common spiritual conviction extending throughout ancient cultures and binding them together and establishing the foundation for the later interchange of philosophy, science, religion, art, and culture. But prior to this time, the isolations of beliefs were so complete that the possibility of a common foundation did not exist. Therefore, Mueller says that at this time was to be placed the greatest single unfoldment of human hope toward a better time that marked the early period of history. This, I think, is well worth our attention. Continuing downward toward the Christian era, we then come to the year 1800 B.C., uh, which, according to the Hindu record, marks the end of the period of the Vedas, or what is called the Great Vedic Era, and the rise of what was known in Asia as the Mantric Period. Now, the Mantric Period was that which marked the transition between law and intercession in religion. In other words, it was the beginning of the rise of the ethical religious concept in Asia, as we know it. This does not mean that the earlier peoples had no ethics, but it does mean that at this time, the ethical emphasis became to dominate religion, and religion began to separate itself from a legistic code, the eye for an eye and the tooth for a tooth concept, and began to move toward the forgiveness of sin and the doing good to those who injure us. It was a great period of truth and love rising victorious over strength and law. It was the victory of love over law, not the dissolution of law, but the reinterpretation of law, so that the strength of God and the power of God began to be deeply considered as the love of God. And deity became not only the great celestial king but began to take on the aspects of the Divine Father, or the 
paternal principle in relationship to the affairs of mankind. This period also corresponds fairly closely with the Jewish exodus and the rise of another group of important culture factors, the rise of a powerful monotheistic teaching in both Egypt and the Near East, a redefinition of deity, and greater emphasis upon the worship of deity as this related to the continuance of the life and happiness of the individual. In other words, personal worship taking the place of state ceremonialism as a form of religious observance. The year 1200 in Asia, 1200 BC, dates the birth of Rama, the great avatar of Vishnu, and is the great cycle or period of the Ramayana, or the great classical work, which was also a powerful landmark not only in Asia but in other parts of the world. The Ramayana introduces us uh, to again to a new concept of human relationships. It is the beginning of the glorification and deification of the natural relationships of human beings. In the Ramayana, the faithful husband and the faithful wife emerge as performing the ritual of faithfulness, that affection for one's brother, common regard for other human beings emerges as part of the basic ritual of religion. So we see great and peculiar steps moving downward. This period also coincides with the period of the compilation of the oldest 14 books of the Old Testament, the beginning of the rise of religious literature as we know it today. For well, prior to that time, a work such as the Bible or any collection of essentially religious works were comparatively unknown. Prior to that, most of the so-called sacred writings were in the form of epics relating to the origin and histories of peoples, but not emphasizing a class of spiritual writings set apart uh, as scriptural or constituting holy text. The next period then, after that, comes to 600 B.C. And it is there that we wish to pause for the rest of the evening because that's where we have to do uh, our work tonight. And this has been well called and pointed out to us as the era of the ancient teachers. Sometimes we wonder at the extraordinary circumstance that so many of the most important leaders and important motions in the development of our religious, historical, philosophical, and scientific life were contemporary at that time. Not only were they so contemporary, but there were tremendous changes in the political map of the world. There were great changes within the structure of peoples. There was the rise, for example, of the democracy of the Greek states. There were great and important reformations in Egypt. There were profound changes in the philosophies and sciences of India and China. It was a period of great motions, motions that were to endure, most of them unchanged, for 600 years. They then continued to endure, but there was not one of these motions that did not pass through a mock reformation 600 years later. So we can begin to consider this era of the ancient teachers. And we know that alive at one time 
or very nearly at one time. Some facts a little difficult to historically date. But we can say this. Within 100 years, there flourished Confucius and Lao Tse in China, Buddha in India, the last of the Zoroasters in Persia, Pythagoras in Greece, and several lesser luminaries, including the so-called Great Sophistic School of the Greeks and the rise of several minor sects in India and China. Thus we have, living together, a number of the greatest thinkers that we know who were also living at the time when the great integration of the Old Testament was at its height. For we know that the Old Testament, or the Septuagint version as we know it today, was in the process of compilation, and that most of the books of the Old Testament that we now have were either revised completely or brought into powerful new organization between the 5th and 6th centuries B.C. This whole period fits together and results in the emergence of a group led almost immediately by Socrates and continuing on with pressure and force throughout the civilized world. We have no proof that these men met, although we have certain possibilities. We have reason to believe from the ancient Chinese annals that Confucius, as a young man, did meet Lao Tse as the older teacher. The tradition, I would say, has reached a degree of being semi-historical. It is rather strongly supported and there seems no reason to consider it incredible. There is also a definite tradition among the Greeks that Pythagoras did study with the last of the Zoroasters. This, however, is open to some question for the reason that the term may have been applied to a priesthood rather than to a person as the Zoroasters or Zarathustras. It may have been a term to cover the fire priests of Persia. We are not absolutely sure. It is conceivable that Pythagoras, having visited India, may have come in contact with Buddha, or at least met some of his disciples. Produce simultaneously a type of instructor who usually is called forth by emergency. In the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Vishnu is made to say, when virtue fails upon the earth, then I come forth. Now at the time of Pythagoras, Greek culture was young. At the time of Zoroaster, the last Zoroaster, if he flourished 600 BC, Persian culture was old. At the time of Buddha, we can say that Hinduism was decadent. At the time of Confucius and Lao Tse in China, we know that Chinese history was comparatively young and the culture comparatively strong. Therefore, we cannot say that these men uh, appeared uh, to read obituary rituals over the deaths of peoples, nor can we say that like the seers of old they came to stand at the cradle of new cultures. This cannot be said. What then do we find as the common denominator? The common denominator appears to be that all of these groups, young or old, were afflicted with certain limitations and internal corruptions. These men all moved against what might be termed man's inhumanity to man. 
they moved against the tyranny of privileged groups and the suppression of the rights of individuals. Buddha thought to overcome a caste system in India that was a strong slavery of the later world. Lhotse was completely disillusioned with the mental and spiritual life of China. Confucius was seeking a restoration of just government for his people and the establishment of a higher level of cultural education not only for the masses but for their leaders. Pythagoras came at a time which was a transition in the entire life of Greek thinking because he emerged with the rise of the sophists or the professional educators of Greece and was in strong rebellion against the commercialization of education. Each one had his own particular problem with which he was working. But that all these different problems should link together to produce this peculiar historical cycle is to say the least interesting and uh, significant. It is a series of coincidences which have not since been repeated. And yet we do have repetitions of other kinds that are stimulating to us. For example, the tremendous emphasis upon music in the 18th and 19th centuries, the great rise of arts in the Renaissance, and the extension of various cultural motions which come uh, to climactic periods and then decline. There seems therefore to be a time and place for everything under the sun. But these times and places appear to be more than accidental. They represent some kind of a definite pattern a pattern which seems to tell us that human beings get into major trouble as groups about every six centuries. They get into a situation from which it does not seem that they can easily extricate themselves. Or they reach a critical point in which did they continue would lead to the premature disintegration of their civilization. It is quite possible that had not Pythagoras become the great spokesman of Greek learning that the golden age of Pericles could not have followed. For we do realize that it was the tremendous shift to a philosophical basis which he instituted, that became the impetus or bestowed the impetus upon the great rise of philosophy in the Greek states, resulting in about 600 years of philosophy in Greece. Philosophy which definitely continued until the final disintegration of the original academy and the falling apart of Greek national existence under the, un, under the inroads of the Roman Empire. Now it's interesting also to note that the last Greek philosopher is said to have died 680, which would be again one of these climactic periods. Therefore that it took considerable time for the final disintegration of the direct impetus of these schools. The contribution made by Buddha, beginning in the 6th century and extending through the long years of his own life, continued down with comparatively slight change till about the beginning of the Christian era, 600 years after Buddha, rose the great reformations which have been attributed to Sankarachaya 
And these reformations resulted in the complete shift of Buddhism and the rise of the Mahayana or great vehicle. And the principal leaders of that great vehicle movement were contemporaries of Jesus and lived 600 years after Pythagoras. Thus the peculiar involvement of these dates becomes important. Another important point that I think we should realize, and which perhaps has lost a little of its validity in our modern thinking, is that in antiquity, the great changes that were to be noted in the descent of man are always upon the levels of religion and philosophy. Nations rise and fall, states come and go, kings overthrew each other, but the major motions in those periods were not the result of war or the result of the corruption of dynasty except indirectly. The great changes were due to the rise of individuals who made positive claim to revelational insight or who claimed a ministry or claimed a right to contribute to the spiritual enlightenment of their fellow men. Thus at the time we mention, and also at the time of the beginning of the Christian era, the principal motions originated in man's religious convictions. These were the motions which made way for education to rise. I think we should therefore say uh, that 600 years B.C. approximately dates the beginning of man's formal concept of education. It is assumed generally, historically, that the Academy of Pythagoras at Crotona was the first formal educational institution in the Mediterranean area. There is much to indicate that the school of Confucius was the first broad, comprehensive curriculum of education introduced in China. And we know definitely that it was from Buddhism and its emancipating influence upon the public mind that the great university systems of India received their greatest impulse and the most famous institution of learning in the ancient world, the University of Nalanda, came into being. Thus the 600 BC date has in most instances been directly associated with religion as educational liberation. Our friends of that period, with the possible exception of Lao Tse, were not essentially mystics. They were essentially teachers, and even Lao Tse was a librarian of the libraries of the Chu, the highest intellectual position in China. These men were essentially teachers, not preachers. They came with spiritual authority. But their idea of religion was comprehensive. In this era, there was no division between man's religious insight, his arts and his sciences and his crafts. In these days, the total enlightenment of man was in the keeping of the ancient teachers. And the spiritual leader was also the grammarian, the mathematician, the astronomer and many cases, in fact usually, the physician. The records, for instance, left by Pythagoras give us some realization of the broad scope of the man's achievement. He is remembered, of course, for his magnificent contribution to math mathematics, particularly the great 47th, or, uh, 47th proposition or Pythagorean proposition in geometry. He is remembered for his researches in astronomy and cosmogony. He is accredited with the discovery of the diatonic scale in music. He is recognized as one of the earliest exponents of the formal type of poetry, particularly the use 
of the hexameter meter. He is known as a physician and an expert on color, number, and many other subjects. He was a man of universal learning. For in these days, leadership in philosophy implied achievement in astronomy, mathematics, and music. And Pythagoras was a musician. Confucius was a musician. And these men, in no sense of the word, could be regarded as limited to what we might term a theological religious perspective. They had no such restriction upon themselves. All learning was their scope. In a large measure, the same thing is true of Buddha. And we find frequent references in the ancient Buddhistic writings to his attainments in other subjects than that which we regard as associated with him, uh, philosophy and religion. We know that uh, the last of the Zoroasters was regarded as a man of exceptional attainments in medicine and in many other fields of learning. Thus we have a, a synthetic uh, approach rather than an analytical one. And we find the outpouring of streams of intellectual energy aimed at preserving and sustaining the security of peoples. We have these men, and at the same period, the rise of the great lawgivers of Greece, Solon, Pitakas, Periander, Cleobulus, the men who gave to Greece its great codes of law. We also have rising in China, great systems of legislative code. And in this period also, the rise of Chinese and Indian astronomy. They were rich periods of outpouring. And these outpourings became the strength of the various cultural groups. India remained essentially sound in its Buddhistic teaching for approximately 600 years. China enjoyed the great mystical revelation of Lao Tzu until about the beginning of the Christian era when mysticism in this field began to move into other manifestations. Taoism is divided into three distinct periods. These periods corresponding again in timing with the Phoenix Cycle. From these various considerations, we come to a major one, therefore. Namely, that for some reason, nearly every work of man must be subjected to powerful revitalization, periodically. Today, we will say, in all probability, that necessity produced the sage. That in some way, it was the emergency in man's own nature that called upon his own brother man to rise and meet that need. I doubt if the ancients would have argued with this point of view, but they would also have pointed out uh, that history, being the sequential unfolding record of events, the history in some mysterious way frames this pattern of needs, distinguishes them, this, this pattern, as though it runs upon a ladder. And that history, therefore, is an integrated organism. That history is not a record of incidents or accidents, but a continuous report of the unfolding of basic and immutable laws that these laws are under the control of cyclic energy. And we can gain certain sympathy in this thinking from Spengler's work on the decline of the West. In this work, Oswald Spengler points out that all great civilizations are cyclic, that civilizations are therefore composite human beings. 
And as man passes through birth, growth, <coughs> infancy, maturity, and decline, so cultures have great cyclic patterns moving inevitably from their humble beginnings, beginnings with tremendous energy and little experience, to their ends, which is greatness of experience and exhaustion of energy. The things die of fatigue, and that when institutions die, a psychochemistry takes place. Institutions are merely hypothetical boundaries on the continuance of the unbroken stream of human life itself. It may be that a pattern is exhausted, but the persons living in that pattern must in many instances survive it <coughs> and must pass through what we call transition periods periods of moving from one pattern into another. Thus every 600 years the human being confronts a personal emergency. The personal emergency is not the collapse of a cycle. The emergency is the danger that he himself will collapse with it. His inability to face transition. We find this even in the shorter cycle of human life, where it is estimated that very few persons are able to maintain individuality of thought, emotion, and action after the 50th year. By that time, the pressure of circumstances disillusionments and the gradual depletion of energies results in the individual taking cover in some form, hiding under something, seeking protection, and gradually passing the reins of progress on to someone else. He finds that it is increasingly difficult for him to maintain the momentum of progress he sees it move by him and becomes a stranger in his own world. Now every 600 years, according to this ancient calculation, great masses of human beings are confronted with this matter of transition period. These masses of human beings are of all ages individually. The transition may strike one person in childhood and another in maturity and another in advanced years because the transition represents an arbitrary pattern of climaxes. Now we like to think of the fact and often refer to the fact that we are living perpetually in transition. We are. But we look back over, for instance, the 19th century. The last half of it certainly was, for most persons, a comparatively tranquil period. Not tranquil perhaps in terms of their personal existences, but tranquil in terms of comparatively low taxes, comparative freedom of action, and the ability to live their lives, if in a somewhat humble manner, much according to the dictates of their own consciences, or according to the circumstances which they themselves had created. Now we come into this century and observe the individual more and more the victim of mass motions over which he has no authority. Therefore we may say that he appears to be approaching a climactic period. Yet this climactic period may be only one of the lesser transitional situations that he has to face. Certainly there is continual transition. But there come times when these transitions heap together, forming such tremendous patterns that they require an almost complete reorientation of a way of life. Later we will observe that the beginning of the Christian era, also one of these 600 year points, <coughs> 
was perhaps in the earlier periods of things the greatest and most dynamic of these transition periods. A transition between two ways of life that were never to meet again, that were never to have even valid relationships after they once separated at that time. So here we have what might be termed in the 6th century BC the emergence of integrated human record by some very strange uh, circumstance also perhaps difficult to classify but obvious the year 600 BC is often chosen by historians arbitrarily to represent what they consider the beginning <coughs> of trustworthy, detailed, chronological descent of events. <coughs> From 600 B.C. to the present time, we have an almost unbroken historical record. There are flaws in it, and there are weak points. <coughs> but never do we get into the same dilemma again that existed in the year 700 B.C. when we have almost no records of any kind. There was a broad dividing line. Why? Obviously because the training of men's minds under the impact of the philosophic system began to produce the type of thinking which related events and also prepared for the more conscientious effort to explore history in terms of the mental and moral life of individuals. It was not until about 600 B.C. that we begin to find historical records of common people, if we want to call them that, those uncommon individuals whose lives consisted only of ordinary circumstances, untouched by the great motions and glamours of high office. We begin in 600 B.C. to meet the farmer, the merchant. We begin to see emerging for us the little businessman. We have some contact with the musician, the artist, even the clown. We find the petty politician who never got anywhere coming out as a person. And we also find the interesting emergence of theater and the beginning of a psychological analysis of the foibles of human nature. We find men like Aristippus and we find playwrights ridiculing the fallacies and foolishness of mortals. We see them picking on characteristics and doing so in those happy days without fear of lawsuit. At that time human character was in public domain and you could say anything that you could get away with. Thus Whereas in the 10th or 12th centuries we are told that a certain king or a certain prince overthrew his enemies and built a monument to his own victory, or we hear that the priests of Delphi, one of the more common type of records, in that year reported a certain number of healings or a certain number of oracles, or that navigators brought back their spices from the Far East. We hear a few things of this nature. But on this side of the year 600, we hear of nagging families, delinquent children, fussy ancestors. We, we begin to hear of private lawsuits, of the individual who dared to differ with authority. Uh, the person who appears in the petty courts to solve a grievance. He is only a shadow, it is true, but he is there. So we begin to have the history of peoples. We begin to have the history of the little individual 
and his place in the large picture. We also begin to gain considerable information as Wilkinson points out for the first time we begin to know what people wore what kind of shoes they had on. We learn a little of the trinkets that they wore and we learn the secrets of Greek and Egyptian cosmetics and also vital statistics on the brewing of beer. We get all kinds of things that we did not know anything about before. So on this side of that critical point humanity as we know it today comes into view. Now it could not have come into view and would have been meaningless had not this division period resulted in the rise of what we term today acute observationalism. Our philosophers began to accept the challenge of the Egyptian who said that the proper study for mankind is man. So attention began to be turned upon man. And from the sheer contemplation of divine matters and a recording of the activities of Olympian deities, history begins to take on the coloring of the human being his relationship to history and his relationship to the changing patterns of the day in which he lived. From this date, therefore, we must theoretically found our observational psychology. For we know that at that time the records were established, the analyses were made, the clinical observations were recorded which made possible the work of men like Freud, Adler, and Jung. For from that time on, we begin to see a human being moved by compulsions, harassed by neuroses, burdened with frustrations, and valiantly struggling to adjust himself to the insecurity of his own internal life. Thus the emphasis upon all these elements of growth and the almost complete obscuration of politics. What do we know today, for example, actually, of the politics of Greece during the age of Grecian philosophy? We know almost nothing and care less. We know the archons were not all they should have been but we took that for granted. We realized that in this period the great heroes were the thinkers, the creators, and that we are indebted to them for the mysterious rise of many systems of exact thought which we have built upon but which we did not invent. The origin being in those earlier and perhaps less chronicled but reasonably well defined years. Thus a great change did take place and among the Egyptians the attitude was held that there were streams of energy moving behind history that history is the account of the physiological functions of one collective living entity. That history is the record of the life of an entity. That entity being composed of all living things functioning during that period or existing under that pattern. When the Egyptians formed their statue of Serapis at Alexandria, they composed its body by mingling together every known element and substance so that plants, animals, minerals, everything that man knew to exist, all these parts were fitted together into a strange and cunning contrivance and constituted the body of this deity. This deity is therefore a kind of historical personification because history is the story of the life in the rock and the shell. What we call geology is only 
a kind of history. Anthropology is a kind of history. And this entire pattern is actually, finally, only the report of the motion of energy. History is therefore the account of what energy does, how it does it, and when it does it. History is consequently actually concerned not primarily with persons or even events, but with motion. And motion itself is a primary attribute of life. Life moving. Now life in its motion, in everything that lives and moves, is subject to the law of alternation. Everything that lives, comes and goes, wakes and sleeps, lives and dies, grows and decays. Just as the annual story of the tree, which in winter drops its leaves and appears dead, so, as Plato has pointed out, the great motions of energy are tidal. And these tidal motions mean that the flow of energy through the sequence which we call history is not continuously the same. That there are periods in which energy is superiorly abundant, and there are other periods in which energy is deficient. And wherever energy is abundant, motion and the qualitative consequences of motion, these are themselves abundant, <coughs> or as the Greeks said, luxuriant. In a luxuriant period, there is an unfolding and releasing of life. Just as the individual feeling well on Monday turns out a great day's work, and being a little weary of a Thursday does not do so well. So, if energy is abundant, according to the qualitative concept of the ancient, if the great tidal motion of energy is flowing, then there is a simultaneous release of vitality. Now, in many parts and levels of the world, obviously such release is again conditioned. The individual may feel very good, but if he has few abilities, he may still accomplish little. Whereas another man, not feeling even quite so well, may accomplish more because of having additional abilities and resources in himself. Therefore, a release of energy into organism or organization does not mean that all of these energized areas will react simultaneously or identically. But it does mean that there will be more energy available than at other times, and that this energy released in highly cultured peoples will result in strong cultural motions, and released perhaps only through a warlike people may result in additional militarism or activity on that level. Also, in those epochs or eras in which energy is deficient, when the great tidal motions are ebbing, there will be a corresponding diminution of available resources. And this diminution, according to the Greeks, is notable first in the most sensitive areas of man's cultural existence. Therefore, wherever energy is involved, its depletion means that the best dies first. That which represents the use of the most subtle energies will first feel any change in the motions of those energies. 
that which requires the most balanced vitality to maintain its own equilibrium will be the first affected. Just as we may say that the most sensitive and highly uh, cultivated plant may be the first to feel the frost. The weed will live for a long time but that which depends upon a highly sensitized environment may be quickly blighted. So the decline of civilization, as the Egyptians pointed out, is always measured by the failure of creative idealism on the level of leadership. <coughs> the greater incentives fail. And as the greater leader fails in the collective, so the greater faculty of leadership is the first to fail in the individual. Under a blight, therefore, ideals, inspirations, creativity, these are the first to suffer. So that we find wherever energy has this diminishing factor notable within it, that the grosser part survive the longest. And therefore, that a soul may perish in one century, but the body may not die for one, two, or three centuries more. Just also as the decline in organization may result in senility, in which the body may endure, but the faculties are no longer <coughs> capable of active function. So a people, passing from acuteness of maturity to the senility of age, first grow irrational, even though for a time the body may appear to be healthy. Philosophy has therefore observed that it is the failure of the rational factor which must herald the ultimate disintegration of the physical structure. And this they point out through the long descent of historical record. If, as Plato has told us, the great year consists then of these periods of fertility and sterility, we have the factor that is also paralleled in the Hindu concept of the Kali Yuga. We have in this period a loss of energies, a diminution of vitalities. The Hindu tells us, of course, that the great cycle of messianic dispensations or avatars, that this cycle is always associated with the Kali Yuga, because it is in this period that man becomes incapable of the solution of his own problem. And it is therefore during this period that intercession is emphasized in religion. The laws of certain energies make it necessary or at least a highly important that man be continually brought back as far as possible to the reintegration of his psychic life. In a period which is not the Kala Yuga, man will not fall into these patterns of ignorance and therefore does not need to be lifted out of them by any particular uh, requirement. Assuming, for example, the Greek legend of the Golden Age, when everyone lived together happily, peacefully, and in continual bliss, it would hardly be necessary at such time for, have interse for intercession to prevent the individual from collapsing. Thus, we would not need reformers unless many themselves fall away from law. We do not need revelation unless man has lost the power to know himself and to understand the roots of his own spiritual integrity. Thus, the year 3000 BC in the Hindu calendar would mark the beginning of the age of the avatars because it would mark the need or the beginning of the pattern in which man must be instructed from some level of consciousness beyond his own immediate availability. So history would move from that pattern. 
Now as these things go from their various sequences, if we are dealing with the Phoenix cycle, we know that this cycle does not end in death. That the Phoenix cycle ends always with the concept of resurrection. We must therefore also realize that energy moving through the body of history may, like the phoenix, have only one body at a time, because it is a collective thing. It is using all body. But that the phoenix is never unembodied, for when its time comes to die, it builds its own nest of flames and perishes on it, which might be another way of stating the old phrase that we make our own beds and then have to lie in them. In other words, we have a strange historical peculiarity of how civilizations disappear in flames of some kind. Not fire as we see it, but in the Holocaust of the collapse of great cultural motions which usually lead to temporary pandemonium. But before its actual death, or at the moment of death, the body of the dead bird breaks open and the young newborn phoenix is liberated to fly to the altar of the sun at Heliopolis and pay offerings and tribute to the great gods. The great gods being, in this case, of course, the symbols of the great universal laws that cannot be violated. So the death of the phoenix is always a birth process. And the great critical periods of historical dissolution have always been periods not only of the throes of death, but of the travail of birth. Things are born out of death forever, even as creativity is born out of disillusionment, and the greatest hope of man is born from his deepest despair. Thus in the Phoenix Cycle, all of the things which ended uh, with the death of the old Phoenix were brought forth and made new by the restoration of the new Phoenix. In this case, the rise of the great era of the teachers, who become the embodiments or personifications of the phoenix cycle, or the phoenix energy. If you study the period of 600 B.C., you will see how a great tradition, about 600 years old and in its own infirmity, had reached the point where it could no longer sustain progress where it could no longer liberate man from the psychological pressure of tradition. So just as the ancient American Indian in Central America burned all his records every 52 years and declared himself free from the past, so every so often in this holocaust of the death of the phoenix, man must burn the bridges of tradition by which he limits and restricts his own action. We see this also in the problem of personal living. By the time the individual reaches 60 or 70 years of age, he has worked himself into a pattern from which he can no longer escape, except in a very small minority of cases, and from which death is his only release. It's his only opportunity for a fresh start at anything. Nations, cultures, peoples, religions work themselves into these patterns where crystallization under the name of tradition locks motion and causes this great sea of energy, this great current of energy, this irresistible force to come head on into an immovable object. The immovable object being the crystallization that sets in around any idea in the course of six centuries. A man has an idea, and 600 years later, the world is locked by that idea. Man hasn't realized 
that ideas must be perpetually new. We cannot live by the ideas of the past. We can use them. But if we say this was revealed infall infallibly and inevitably, and to this we must abide, abide, 600 years from now, that law, that rule, will be a complete prison upon us, locking us utterly. So that in 600 years, the phoenix grows old, the law grows old, the dispensation grows old. The institution grows old. And man must either die with it, or else the institution must break and die for man, releasing man from itself. Thus the death of the phoenix also definitely represents the breaking of these cyclic patterns. And this is usually accomplished by a reformation by the arising of individuals with new and important viewpoints, breaking through tradition and usually dying themselves at the hands of tradition. They may not actually die physically, but they are certainly opposed by tradition. Pythagoras was a martyr to it. Later, so was Socrates. Confucius regarded himself as a heartbroken failure because he was never able to break the tradition in which his life was patterned. Lao Tse walked out on the tradition completely and riding on a green ox went out into the Gobi Desert to die as the lesser of two evils. <laughs> Buddha for 83 years struggled with the tradition. He was perhaps the most fortunate of them all. Zarathustra Spitama died in Persia with an assassin's spear in his back. Thus the phoenix dies, the bird dies, dies in flames, but is born again. Constantly death giving birth to life. But against the tremendous weight of tradition rises the, the mysterious symbol of martyrdom which is the greatest tradition-breaking force of all time. The great religions are nearly always associated with martyrdom. They represent a pattern by means of which man is released, breaks through, develops a new conscience mechanism, and starts out on another cycle which will in turn grow old and hold him in bondage at the end of another 600 years. It seems to take in the world of events that length of time for a common social motion to pass through the seven ages of its existence. Coming in the end, after the six days of labor or the six centuries, to a Sabbath of rest, it can no longer go on. <coughs> Now, if we took history and studied it in this light, it would be quite possible to fill in innumerable details and begin to see the tremendous chemistry of motion meeting obstacle, the tremendous psychological chemistry which results in the emergence of these great energized persons who become the custodians of new ways and become the leaders of the next phoenix cycle. These leaders in turn, or those who come after them, must in due course take their own aging bodies back to the altar of the sun and there voluntarily die that a new age may be born. Therefore greatness voluntarily dies in order that it may forever release man from bondage to greatness and push man forward to the emancipation of his own consciousness. Later, other factors appear to take on coloring, and the essential religious elements are not so obvious. But in all the periods prior to the Christian era, and including it, these great changes 
have been identified almost completely with spiritual leadership. With the coming of the Christian era, we see, again, the tremendous emphasis upon the escape of the individual from a tradition, an old way that had once been new and beautiful, had gradually been corrupted by the decadence of man until it began to take a stranglehold upon the freedom of human consciousness. Then it was that it was necessary to whip the money changers from the steps of the temple. Then it was that the veil had to be rent and the earth torn, at least in the great symbolical account for again, the individual had to be freed from the negative phase of history, which is tradition. Now, tradition can be good or bad. Tradition which inspires us is the source of great good. Tradition which captures us and holds us, limits us, is a great danger. And all tradition begins by inspiring and ends by enslaving. So man must continually renew the principles of his life. Each of these great cycles, therefore, is involved in making all things new again, in order that the individual may once more experience the dynamic of free action, free choice, voluntary decision. As soon as he has decided for himself, he begins to decide for others. And the moment he decides for others, his culture begins to die. The moment he denies to another the right he demands for himself, he begins to lock and enslave. And this is the story of history. This is the part of history which we cannot forget. This is the part of history which we must explore down through the various cycles with which we are concerned. So next week we are going to psychoanalyze historically probably the greatest era that we know, the beginning of the Christian era, and the effects of it upon the world which was to come after. <laughs>